this pressure wash drilled out the broken bolt down there and uh, I think we're ready to reassemble got some silicone paste to just kind of hit all the sealing surfaces to help them until they kind of seat back in since everything's been changed around put this back together and hopefully try it out today Okay, so when they broke the one off, the stud off in this one, the reason they bent it, putting it back together, is because they didn't tap it straight. I could see that they had tapped those holes out, that hole out down there, because there's part of the old brass fastener kind of uh, off to that one edge. And I'm going to pause, see if I can re-tap it just a little bit more on axis. All right, so I started the tap and it was cocked off the side, so threaded it in four or five turns and then kind of turned it half a turn back and forth while putting pressure this way just to kind of recut the right side of the threads a little bit. Uh, it's not great because it's going to be a worse thread fit overall, but I'd rather have it rely on the force of it wanting to be drawn coaxial when it tightens down to cam into the threads than have it bend this, uh, you know, nice new bolt I made. And worst case, I have to do a you know thread repair on it in the future. It's not the end of the world if it was to pull out, but of course I'd rather avoid all of that. I'm not crazy about how maybe they replaced these rubbers. I'm not crazy about how that's like a over a quarter inch. You know, that's almost three eighths of an inch, but it's a. Uh, sloppy on here. I mean, it just seals. I wonder if when they probably what happened is the original seals were something that degraded. I almost want to put a, like a bushing in there or make, just make a new rubber valve real quick. Uh, just will catch. I think it's okay, but if I have performance issues or want to improve this again in the future, that's what I'll do is come in and add a bushing or add a different seal to this. And I guess that's the other question is I, I commented in the initial video about how far this opens. I wonder if this is way thicker than the original valve material would have been. So that's another option if I want to improve the flow is uh, put a thinner valve material in here. I guess there was no reason for me to lap the top side of that either when I cleaned it up on the sandpaper, but I mean, it's not hurting anything. So this should tighten down to the point where that doesn't move anymore. Next up will be this gasket. Seems fine. It's a little chill. This is probably not replaced whenever the last person was in here. I'm gonna hit. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna get a scraper to clean that up. Yeah, that barely, because I, when I retapped it, it's still ever so slightly, um, well, more than slightly off axis to the left, so it just catches that seat down there. Maybe before we close this up, and put, well, we'll put the plugs back in, and we'll make sure all four valves hold water and we get nothing out of here. We'll do that before we put the, the lid back on. And the gasket, it's a little chewed up, that's why I just scraped off of here with pieces of gasket stuck behind. I'm just going to coat this all with some silicone paste to help it maybe swell up and seal where some of these indents are. It wouldn't be hard to make another one of these. Alright, I'm going to go get the plugs for all these four or five openings. And then do a, a water test here at the bench before putting the rest of this together. Try some water in here and see what happens.
Inlet looks good. Let me check the flashlight in there. Nice and dry. That's just, I felt it too much. All right, so we got a little dribble in the front here. The front valve is dribbling in a little. I'm, oh, that's right. These have the grooves cut in them for them to leak back a little bit. I bet you the back one's doing the same thing. So let's go with that. I think we're good. I did try taking this stud out, so when I was drilling the broken nut out, or bro broken uh, shoulder bolt out, I did try taking the stud out with a a pipe wrench, and uh, it's in there really good. I would have needed to bolt this down to my welding table, probably heat the inside of the casting up, and then maybe get this out. It wasn't worth it. That is probably why they had to drill the last repair at an angle. This really interferes with any drill I have. I couldn't quite get it perfectly vertical. I got close. Got a little closer than they did. All right, let's just check parts we got here before we go in. So we've got the Schrader valve cap over there. Got this rubber. It goes on the piston, the connecting rod down there. This nut for up here. This plug for here. I'll put a little bit of something on there. I think this is a like a mica washer or something, a gasket here, and so I want to I lubricate that so it doesn't tear up going on here. I'm gonna scrape this off too. We've got our two-piece packing nut set up, fill plug on the inlet side. The threads are fine. It's just, they're not loose enough to do go crazy tight or to feed it on by finger, but... Definitely going to hit this with some silicone to help it slide in and get started. Because that's, in theory, you know, pretty dry in there. And this is, yeah, I mean, this is seeing better days. I will end up doing some research pause the camera and take a couple of measurements of this to shop around for modern kind of cup plunger piston uh piston or piston sealed whatever these would even be called Here. So I I don't know which way they had some of these things set up here. That's definitely a cover for the top of the piston because it's it's visible right there. This protects it. And then this, I mean, this was floating on there. I don't know where it's meant to sit exactly, but we'll put them on the right order. Let's see. Go there, then the nut. I'll just I'll tap that dust shield back on there. The uh, the this five sixteenths rod, the threads on the top of the piston there. That oh, is actually a through hole in the piston. So when I tip this over, carrying it outside, a bunch of oil actually came through it. So I got to top the oil off again. Right, got that snugged. Just tap that in there a little bit.
Here is the mediocre proof of concept set up for the water reuse system. The pump is running great. You may have seen a short I put out earlier in the week just showing the first run and some of the leaks and uh, initial kind of observations. So that while this is still a proof of concept with temporary wiring and plumbing, I have since fixed up the leaks, adjusted the pressure range, improved some of the start-stop behavior, and concluded that I'm probably going to switch out the start capacitor with something bigger and uh, try and get it to start a little more gracefully. But overall, this looks promising. I've got a 60-gallon pressure tank here. Uh, I think I've got about 30 gallons of useful drawdown when I'm running it from 20 to 40 PSI. A couple of IBC totes that are in the process of getting rinsed out, but it gives me water to test with. And that'll uh, give me about 600 gallons of storage for now. You can always add more. This is just the temporary setup to uh, kind of prove everything. And then this will eventually all be ending up uh, behind the greenhouse along our fence line over there. Probably build a little shed for this to go into. So overall, this is uh, kind of a successful end to the, the pump work itself. Uh, there's not much more to do on this right now except for uh, putting a larger start capacitor in and uh, taking some current measurements with you know, the different capacitor values. Uh, I've also been playing a little bit with graphing the current versus pressure on this. I've got a pressure transducer I can thread into uh, the fitting on the, the pump or the one of the outlets of the tank here just to graph the pressure and then also the current as the tank is filling up to make sure, you know to understand the how this is performing and what kind of load it's under. I may also try one of those notched V belts between the pump and the motor. It allows, I guess, for less power loss in bending of the rubber and maybe friction on the sides of it. So eventually this will all get wired into the location against the fence line. Uh, the greenhouse has a 50 amp sub panel, so when I trench some water lines over for uh, feeding the storage tanks from the sump pump, and then also running water out of this pressure tank to the points of use, I'll also be able to trench some conduit over for uh, like a 15 or 20 amp circuit for this. I'm also be experimenting in the future with using Raspberry Pi for a bunch of monitoring of this system just to avoid damaging anything. Uh, if we ever have automated watering drawing out of this, I'll want the system to cut out if the tanks run out of supply to the pump. Maybe with a level sensor in the side of the tanks or a float from the top and or some current monitoring on the pump to tell if the amount of current drops, indicating that it's lost prime and is under less load, or if the current goes up, indicating that it's stalled or has some kind of mechanical failure. Um, if I can get current transducer hooked up to a Raspberry Pi, then I can set some thresholds for stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so proof of concept looks pretty good. All this sketchy temporary wiring and plumbing will uh, go away over the next few weeks. For the leaks I had to address, the main one was at the end of the bore here. Under the operating pressure inside the cylinder, it was spraying water out past the seal, even though I did try to tighten that plug down quite a bit. So I ended up taking it off, uh, kind of lapping that surface more with sandpaper and a block of metal, and then cleaning up the, the mica or whatever seal is on there further to give it a better flat sealing surface, set of sealing surfaces. And uh, that plus snugging it up a little more stopped leaking. There was originally a little bit of leak around the uh, the split in the two castings here, but just tightening the the main nut on the pressure cavity down took care of that. I, I didn't go crazy tight on it before. And uh, I think the the packing or stuffing box there did originally leak a little bit, but I just tapped that with a brass punch and a hammer a little bit and got rid of those leaks as well. I might. Take apart the motor. Uh, there, you can see there's some like mud dauber type of nests inside there, a bunch of other probably debris and dead bugs. I'll probably take that apart and clean it. I might consider doing a uh, ball bearing conversion on it. Since I need to rinse these IBC totes out of their old contents, it was uh, mulch colorant, so nothing too 
interesting or concerning, but since I need to rinse that out a few times, I figured it's a chance to run water through this and get some measurements. So this is the setup I'm using to measure current. Uh, I'm using a logging multimeter to measure the current, and I start that recording while I drain the tank down to its cut-in pressure. As soon as the motor kicks on, I stop draining. I'm going to get a full cycle captured up until it kicks off. Then I'm going to do the same thing again while measuring the pressure. Then I'll hopefully be able to overlay the two and look for signs that the pump is starting to either get overloaded at a certain point or something, uh, or maybe I would repeat this experiment a few times and increase the cut out pressure to see how much capacity I get for each unit of additional runtime. So far I just measured I'm getting about 23 gallons of drawdown running from approximately 20 to 40 psi. I'll be able to verify the exact pressures on the next test. I need to try and find a data sheet for this pressure tank. I, I feel like it should be a little higher, um, or maybe it's just newer 60 gallon tanks made by A.O. Smith. I think advertise a max drawdown of 44 gallons. That's probably at the highest pressure, uh, but I, I would feel like at the lowest pressure, 20 to 40 psi, I should get more drawdown than that. So see if I can find some more information or just uh, kind of work my way into it with the data that's available. And here's the same thing for pressure. I've got a pressure transducer hooked up into the multimeter here. And uh, I'm going to get the same timeline of readings. Uh, it's hard to tell exactly what the cut-in pressure was based on this, and that gauge on the tank is not 100% accurate. Um, I did notice that with the transducer hooked straight up to the pressure cavity on the pump, that the pressure inside there did bleed down after the last cut out. Uh, you know, slowly, and that, I mean, that's, I don't mind that because it's going to help the pump start, but I guess that means that the outlet valves of the pump are leaking back towards the tank just a little bit, uh, but the check valve between the pump and the tank is holding fine. So I don't mind that, uh, but when I go to adjust the capacitor value to see if it can start under load, I'll have to make sure that the pressure cavity is actually pressurized to, to accurately repeat that test. So having this visibility into what the pressure is inside that cavity will be helpful. So I'll measure this data, overlay the two, and then we'll see if anything interesting shows out in there. So here's the first layover of the data. It's not exactly what I wanted because the, the two separate cycles I used for the amp versus the pressure were different durations. I synchronized the start times, but you can see the blue line for the pressure lasted, uh, I think, like 20 seconds or 30 seconds longer. So uh, nothing too interesting in this first view. But uh, we can see that the pressure is slightly superlinear, barely, and the current is ever so slightly superlinear in the last portion. In the second chart, I shifted the axis on the right for current so we can see a little more detail of what's going on. Uh, the inrush is still visible and trimmed at the beginning. But the pressure and current relationships seem, you know, again here, mostly linear. The current does start to increase a little faster. We can see it dips below the pressure curve and then back above it. So 40 PSI or so cutoff is probably about right for what this motor wants to handle load-wise. Uh, I think in this test it did cut off. Well, it's hard to tell exactly since they weren't the exact same duration, but it could have been exactly 40. It could have been 37, 38, but that seems to be about the right place. I do want to repeat this experiment again, capturing both pieces of data at the same time. Uh, my multimeter is only a single channel logging multimeter. I'm thinking I might test this and try to record this using a oscilloscope with a Raspberry Pi or a Linux, you know, using Python and Jupyter Notebook or something to capture the data and plot it. So let me know if that's something people would be interested in. I might do it anyway. And then we'll look at that data. And then if I have, if I do pick up that notched V-belt, that should give us some better power transmission or better efficiency from the motor to the pump then that would give us uh, something else to look at and potentially overlay as well. So that's it for this video. Everything's back together. Future videos might include those measurements and looking at the data there, as well as uh, cleaning up the inside of the motor and who knows, maybe seeing if there's any performance difference or efficiency gain from that, although I kind of doubt it. And then later on, uh, I might have videos in a few weeks when I get to build, putting the rest of the system together, uh, showing some of the other materials, parts, design, layout, and whatnot, uh, if that's of interest to anyone as well. Thanks for watching.